All right, we're going to get going for about another half hour-ish. Um, basically synthesize, kind of synthesize some of the stuff that I've been hearing and try to make that connection back to the, to the business side again, which we've been talking about business, whether we're talking about trees and forest management or we talk about finance, it's, it's all business in my book. Um, so we're going to do that. First thing I want to share, so paper, because some people were eyeing some of this stuff. Let me just tell you what's up here. I only brought two or three copies, but if people want to take it, take it. And it is all available online. There's a couple of these startup model um, guides. I do have a SAP, <laughs> read the legal term, Maple SAP non-exclusive supply agreement. So we did a draft of like a buy-sell agreement for Maple SAP. I've just got two copies. The rest are online. Um, a maple lease checklist. I've got two, maybe, maybe I have three or four copies of the Sugar Bush Lease Guide. We're not going to get into specifics on these, but know that these are available. They're frameworks. And then I also printed a bunch of copies of the um, 2019 survey. I referenced some of that in the slides yesterday. Uh, you can grab some of those copies. This you can't take. Uh, I don't know if people have gotten this yet. You can buy the hard copy, but I think it's available free online too if you want to get the get the PDF. And for those three scenarios, the lowest number of caps you have is 3,000? We went down to 3,000, yeah. There's actually like seven or eight, or I think there's eight or nine profiles online. Oh, okay. Yeah, so but we did kind of, we went down to 3,500, which is uh, kind of a subjective number. There's this weird, you all know the dynamic. People are sugar makers at five taps, 50 taps, 50,000 taps, and sort of trying to figure out where the threshold is for business, like a, what's the business threshold. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been able to quite kind of do the, like the cherry tomato analogy, but like I got a lot of people that I know that grow tomatoes in the garden and they're not all signed up for the National Tomato Producers Association. But you can get five pe people with five taps and they're fully signed up as a Vermont maple <laughs> <laughs> sugar maker. And, I don't know. So I think that's a great conversation to keep having is this dynamic of what's a full-time business. And Fran, you, you know, mentioned this, people making a goal of it for a livelihood and then what's part-time and then where does sort of hobby and part-time kind of intersect where there's nothing wrong with a part-time business, a, you know, a complementary enterprise to something else. Um, but I'm definitely interested in trying to figure out where those businesses break even at any scale, even if it's not a full salary, just something that's giving back to the family business account rather than something that's taking out of it, you know, because I enjoy it. And I ask because I'm just thinking about the guy in Jamaica, that thousand tap, mm -hmm. you know, so would he be able to put data into his scenario in your online thing and see what his cost may be? I, I think that's the idea with the, co I haven't, so my cost of production research is a much wonkier, but I think the idea is you're going to create a cost of production tool that they could get to that level. Yeah. And are there, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about because there's like a thousand taps, might not be a business, right. considered as much of a business if you're just selling tap, or if you're just selling, or if you're just leasing your taps, but then if you get into like retail, could totally be a bit like a business, right? I, I'd kind of argue the opposite that you, you probably have better run in a break-even enterprise with a thousand taps from the SAP-only perspective because you can go in, harvest that SAP, do your forestry stuff, and be done. Mm -hmm. Once you start bringing on retail marketing, you, you create so many new costs that if I'm going to do an economic analysis, your time and your labor to sell that syrup, although you're going to be generating gross sales, chasing that high-value sales point, if we were to run the full economic analysis, that's where we find that those are labor-intensive activities, and if we cost out people's time, you're, you're going to end up volunteering your time. Well, that's, that's where a lot of it is. It's in the time. So it could be volunteering, or it could be you're not making $30 an hour. Maybe you're making 10 Yeah. Um, and it also depends on like your creativity and innovation and access to markets. I mean, there's people who have nice markets, and they can regularly get 100 bucks or more per gallon <coughs> from everything they're selling. And if they have, you know, again, it's how big is your sugar bush? How much time does it take you to work it? How much investment did you have to put into it? And that's really what we're talking about. Because some sugar bushes cost way more to kind of get into and get set up. And there's your overhead costs. 
And some are a lot cheaper to start up. Yeah. Yeah. Is, and is your tool, is the idea, we're just talking about SAP, strictly SAP businesses, or yeah. going, okay. We stop at the tank, Got basically. <laughs> Um, and we haven't looked into much people concentrating, right. which they're starting to do more, concentrate the SAP on site um, and sell and or transport. Um, that's relatively new, um, so yeah. we haven't never really collected any book data on that, but we'd like to, you know, kind of through the project. If, if there's people who are doing that, we'd be curious how the economics add up. Start with a mobile RO business. Yeah. For how the producers just go from sugar house to sugar house. Yeah, yeah. one with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is something we talked about yesterday, and I did I reran the numbers last night because we were trying to do some numbers. We were talking about that 3,500 tap, and remember, like 54 acres. I used $2,000 an acre because that's an easy thing. If you want to go 1,000 bucks, you know, cut this stuff in half. But I did just map that out. $108,000 loan. We were talking about the rent. What did somebody say that the rental rate they heard in Franklin was like four four bucks a tap, right? So which will be interesting, look at these numbers. So if we, if we, if we did it at 2,000 bucks an acre, annual payment, $15,000, that's cash, right? So now we're talking just cash out the door. Someone's gotta have payment capacity for 15,000 bucks a year. The interest on that's $4,200 a year, right? That's the cost of renting that money from the bank. So if we just looked at the interest payment alone, we're at a buck 20 a tap. So that's kind of like a nice little, I think a benchmark there for like, do I rent, want to rent, you know, do I want to own? It's like, okay, well, the interest alone on that is going to be a, bu a buck 20. I use, I, I use 7% on that, 7% on 10 years. Principal payment, 10,800, right? So this is where we get into that idea of, do I want to rent or do I have the capacity to own? You know, what I call the short game is, can I make cash flow? And then the long game is, what's going on with my balance sheet? How much equity can I generate over time? Um, let's assume I can find a way to create the cash. So I did just break those out a little bit. So that's the interest payment alone, 120, and then principal, not quite 11,000. So three dollars and ten cents a tap principal. So I was going to add that up. I was like, oh, interesting. That's about four, you know, a little over four bucks a tap. So the idea, well, here, right at 4:30 a tap, you could actually be buying the land yourself potentially re renting it out at what the whatever that space is between a buck 20 a tap and that four bucks a tap we heard you could possibly be renting that out to generate some of the principal payment kind of from an investment strategy and again we got to kind of figure out which which person are you going to be in this dynamic are you going to be the leaser looking for the rate or are you going to be the landowner and you have the capacity to kind of make this thing this capital activity happen so this doesn't, you know, I think this is getting to that idea of that, like, lease it or own it analysis. And I, these are some of the metrics that we'd be playing with on that. So a couple more things today before lunch. Uh, talk a little bit about capital access. Did you can talk a little bit about lease and some legal stuff that will come up. I'm hoping for some of your input on some of the, 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 the gory stories or the things that you would think people would want to avoid. Um, just a reminder from yesterday, the SAP and processing investment, when we looked at all of that from our benchmarking work, we got to this like $50 a tap operating, and then when we added in possibly real estate, we're up to 80 or 90 bucks a tap. Um, that's the big one, right, with the processing, and then the SAP we described was a little bit lower, maybe $30 a tap, and maybe getting to, I think, 50 or 60 fully loaded with real estate. So how do you make this stuff work in an agricultural credit format? And, and I'm going to qualify all this because again I work in an agricultural business mindset which is I think different from the way forest economists operate and look at that long-term real estate investment and I think even from yesterday there's a lot of opportunities for some side analyses or projects to try to figure out that interface from our experience doing annualized maple business, maple finance tracking, and then maybe the way some of those forced economists are looking at land acquisitions, equity ownership of real estate, and maybe the potential to generate some revenue or not, just kind of knowing they're holding that land for 30, 40, 50 years. 
But anyway, these are the ones that come up. So the five C's of credit for a future prospective owner, prospective borrower, right? Um, character, conditions, capacity, capital, and collateral. And I wanted to focus on capacity uh, first just to say that we work with people on can they cash flow it? Can they make this payment? Can they come up with the annual payment amount of 15000 bucks a year as that example? Generally, we're doing three-year cash flow forecasts with people. Um, with the cash flow forecast, we're looking at conditions, right? Oh, I don't know. You know, we're, looking, we're trying to look at those market conditions, try to figure out what is the, you know, when Butternut releases its prices every year, can we have a sense of what the market is going to be doing for maple syrup? Uh, we've got expenses, of course, to track, and people have been hemmed up with inflation for, for good reason. So understanding some of those market conditions play into our forecasting to figure out, can people cash flow this thing? Um, we certainly pull some management benchmarks into the situation. I think we've talked quite a bit about yield or trying to make that connection between forest practice. Yesterday, the conversation was, well, what if sweetness is going down after a prescription, but sap volume's going up? I think those are all the dynamics that are certainly at play to drive this cash flow forecast for debt payment. Uh, it's not a debt to asset ration. <laughs> It's more like debt to asset ratio. That's, that's a type of a healthy, healthy ration of debt. Healthy ration of debt with every business <laughs> investment. Um, but there are some there are some indicators that we can do, and I don't want to bore you with stuff that can be found in the literature and found in a glossary. But you know, know that there's tools out there for the business planners. Coming back to the rental thing, um, we mentioned yesterday maybe 70% of the producers that own 5,000 taps or more are also renting or leasing which giving, giving us this clear indication that the larger operations are looking to expand or they're needing to have business to business relationships, operator to landowner relationships, just in order to kind of keep their businesses going or take them to the next level. We do know from that survey work again, economic viability can almost double once you get above 5,000 taps. And this survey we did really, I mean, 5,000 was a really coarse cutoff because we had people from 15,000 to 20 had a few people in the 60,000 tap range. They're not all profitable, and let's just remember that. Like, you can also lose a boatload of money on a large-scale operation. And I think Mark alluded to some of the new operations that maybe come in, and then they're saying, why am I not hitting yields? Well, maybe because that initial forestry assessment or the initial work wasn't really as accurate as it could have been or should have been. Maybe the management of that maple operation isn't up to the same management benchmark that we would expect or need to run a profitable business. So there isn't, uh, and it, there's never any guarantee. Can we talk about Essex County again? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting bashed. <laughs> or Chicken County. <laughs> Equal opportunity for, you know, and, uh, and as a business advisor, I, I do remind people, because they, they, you know, it's just going to be profitable. And you always you sort of say like, you know, well, the folks that are most profitable are also the folks that are probably risking the most as well. Uh, I think any, if anyone's seen a CBD hemp forecasting model in the past four or five years, right? You see like the, the, the amazing profit potential and then you're like, wow, how come we've now reading in the newspapers all of those people that are out of business? Like risk and profit generally go together. I was with a sugar maker tour and we toured this guy's place in Cambridge. It was an old farmer, right on 15, sold probably half his syrup out of, the, out of the farm for cash. His, he had really bailing twine hanging up his main line. Mm -hmm. And people were laughing at it. And the sugar maker I was standing next to, he goes, I wouldn't laugh. The guy's probably got more, more money in his wallet than, than I do, but you know, he just was making do, making syrup, and selling it for cash, and, and not spending, you know, upgrading his tubing system or ROs, you know, so it, yeah. Find a way to make, there's different ways, different ways to make it work, right? Yeah, and I always say, when you go, if you can get to a maple meeting, and you get a few people, or someone make a comment about not, you know, not making any money, and there's always a few people in the huddle that are laughing, you generally look around, and there may be one person that gets kind of quiet, like steps, steps, steps away from the group, goes back and calls their tax advisor to figure out how they're going to 
shelter all the profits from, from the federal government. There's a few people that are really, you know, they're, they're making money, but they may not actually be telling you the way that they're making it. And then I'll be honest to know that, or say as an education person, extension to an outreach, I have not drank my own Kool-Aid to think that what I share is the stuff, the information that I have available is not going to be necessarily the information that's going to be the thing that's going to make people the most money. The, the people that are making the most money, I think people are generous, but I do know pe people have some different tricks up their sleeve that they're willing to work, you know, to make, make their business go. And I like to create, you know, kind of want to support that creativity as well. Um, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Again, just going back to that rental rate um, stat that we had, um, over a million taps in the survey that we did, the number of producers, 42% of the producers were, were renting taps at all scales here. And then when we looked at the tap count, we saw that roughly 40% of the tap count in that whole survey was rented. Just again, I think as we're thinking about this to remember, Yesterday, it wasn't so much about, hey, you got to go from tree to table and do the whole process and sell syrup. Now we also need to remember this, this land ownership piece, is a, it's, a, it's a dynamic. And clearly, there is not an assumption that you need to buy the real estate yourself, operate on that real estate yourself, because we know the statistics are saying there are people that need to or want to engage with other parties to make the whole system work. Um, Rental rates, this came up, but I just, just to reinforce, we see these numbers, 50 to 90, uh, 99 cents, a dollar to a dollar 24 is the norm. Uh, Adam had a great comment this morning, which I've certainly seen is, you, you kind of wonder, well, what's going on with these people that are not getting charged? Let's not forget tax abatement programs and the benefit to the landowner with tax abatement. And in a lot of situations that I've heard, landowners receive the benefit of a tax abatement program and they don't feel the need to necessarily charge full or you know any rate to the operator because they're they don't that that it's inconsequential to, to potential benefit they're already getting by having that property in a, you know under that operating plan. I think also they're often getting syrup. You know I think there's <laughs> there's barter and yeah. stuff that goes on. Uh, exactly. But yeah, the value of um, being able to enroll because a farmer is leasing the land <coughs> and you get yeah, can be quite a bit. Mark, is this by producer or by those of those 1.2 million taps? This was by the average was based on producers that reported a rental rate. Yeah, so the two the 300 people that responded. So it's definitely not weighted to yeah, it's not it's not weighted to the the the, the 30,000 rental re arrangement at one price. Yeah, it's going to be based on on number of producers. Okay. How does the cost difference between renting and ownership stack up with raise rises in land values? Like, is that, is that difference cut if you look at it purely from an investment standpoint to a, Interesting. a, a place where, boy, at the end of the tubing's life cycle, I have no more investment. But if I own the land, I still have the investment in the land. I don't have I don't have an answer to you know any analysis that has looked at changes in appraised values. Um, One thing I'll say about it: not only do you not have the value of that tubing, you have a liability of, of that tubing. If, say, a lease isn't renewed, most leases are going to have a, a, a clause and you need to remove it. And, and we haven't done a thorough assessment, but it's pretty close to the cost of putting it in to take it out. Boom. Depending on if you're really doing everything, you're landfilling it, you're, you're, or whatever you're doing with recycling, it's, it's not insignificant. And so that's, that's something to think about as well. Labor is the big one, though, uh, for removal. It, it's, it's not easy to, to take out. And if you are recycling, you have to do quite a bit of work, labor, to separate various parts and get it to where it needs to be recycled. Yeah, no, it's certainly something that I, I've thought about with these you know, massive operations up in Essex County, and a lot of them are on um, parcels of land that the department has forest legacy easements on. And, you know, are, 
are these businesses going to be there long term or is it going to be that? Mm. We're calling bankruptcy. You, you now have hundreds of miles of tubing yeah, you know, yeah. to deal with. Yeah, there was definitely, yeah. there was at least one meeting that I attended about Forest Legacy and Shivering because Maple was part of the enabling legislation for it, but that was in the 90s, when early 90s, I think. I don't know, what, when was it? Was it in the early 90s? Yeah. First um, one was 1996 or 97. <clears throat> But you know, Sugar admittedly looked different oh, yeah. back then, yeah, and so are... that one meeting was starting to try to work a little bit about what does it mean now in the 2020s. And yeah. but we, we, we were supposed to meet again, and it never happened. Was that five years ago? <laughs> Probably longer. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually pushed hard to to try to get bonds for for the cleanup. I will say that in the lease template that's available, you know. If you're not aware, that we have a, a new lease template that you can kind of work through, and, and it is pretty substantial, a lot more substantial. Than <laughs> we've yeah, more substantial than you may expect. I've but had, that's something yeah. that includes. We, I've written leases, and they wanted bonds, but the poor guy settled it up. Says, I, I just don't. I'm putting this in. I, I just can't. I'll give you my word. I'll do it. I'll sign it. I'll do it. You know, but I kind of get it. But. Yeah. Well, and we're talking like everybody actually has a written lease with that kind of clause in it at all. And I don't know that we have statistics on this. I just know in the rest of my work with farm leases, so much of the land that's, you know, third of all agricultural land in the United States and Vermont's not any different is lease. And I, a lot of my work is around working with people. It's all handshake yeah. leases. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even end up with, you know, if you don't even end up with a lease, and then it, counting on a lease that has something about cleanup, let alone a bond, which is part of the whole effort of, you know, getting those templates together and stuff to make it a little bit more easier to do it. But I've come across property owners. Well, I wouldn't lease to a sugar maker because some guy leased my neighbor's sugar lot, and they left all the lines when they were gone, and they're still there, just hanging there. And you know, and that's I think. You know, still part of the education that we all need to do with both the property owners and the sugar makers about the value of the written leases and these kind of agreements and thinking about long term, including what if you're not there, what are you going to do about the pipeline? Well, well people even being aware, I mean, a lot of landowners might not even, that might not cross their mind that's something to think about if they're new to the game, that this right. tubing needs to be cleaned out. So, um, you know, I've gotten my sugar bush that was started. In the 80s, there's still legacy tubing up there that I'm pulling out from under, you know, six, eight inches of leaf matter, and you know, I want to start a museum with some of it. But um, you know, so a lot of people just leave it there, and it's still there. So if they leave, I'd say the main lines, you probably can get two tubing replacement tools, two tubing replacement without replacing your main lines. I would think that would be attractive for some other sugar maker to lease that again, um, or portions of that, mm -hmm. you know, because that infrastructure is there and that's a cost that you don't have to okay. pay. At the same time, you could say, hey, I want you to rip, you know, you, you probably want to rip the tubing out to replace it. Mm -hmm. but, but you could be right back where you're in another 10, 12 year cycle, right back where it walks away. I, I hear your point. Interestingly, it's not uh, limited to tubing. Um, there's a sugar place up uh, on the side of Kirby Mountain um, that the, uh, the sugar maker actually died mid season um, about 40 years ago. And the buckets are We're all still grown into the tree, and we're talking like a yeah. big area. Well, it's pretty yeah. amazing. I've seen, yeah. wow. I've seen that a couple times. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it, it, it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> they turn them sideways, so the buckets are all kind of facing out from the tree. Yeah. Wow. I'm gonna do like one or two, one more thing on rental, and then we're, we're, it's a good segue into some of the some of the legal situations here. Um, so this had, this I think came up. We had an interesting segue to this. We, what I just gave you was sort of fixed. Tap, tap rental rates, right? And everyone asks, like, who, who came up with that, right? Like, 
who decided that a dollar was a reasonable amount? And when I go to Ohio and if I say something like a dollar twenty-five, they're like, "Whoa, that's like pretty rich." And you're like, "Well, what's your analysis? How do you, how do you get to your fifty cent a tap thing?" And some of these things are, I think, are legacy. Um, but I, so I want to remind people that it came up yesterday. What you're really looking at is the amount of sugar that's coming out of that tap hole, not so much the unit of the tree when it goes down the line to the producer, right? The producer's making money off sugar. He's not selling his tree count to anybody in the marketplace. He's converting it in, into syrup. So we, we should at least be prepared to consider adjustable rental rates for different reasons. Um, certainly crop failure. Uh, it's an agricultural or forestry product subject to risk. It's very possible there's landowners out there that don't want the operator to absorb 100% of the risk related to crop loss. So an adjustable rate could be a great mechanism for a landowner to say, I'm willing to put a little bit on the line here, not have you deal with it. And you know, a rate could be adjusted for that. Uh, the same thing, market price spike, right? Maybe the landowner's thinking, do I deserve to get a piece of that market price increase over time? Per perhaps I do. And that could be a conversation between landowner and lessee and, and discuss how do we want to have kind of like meet in the middle on risk management and then upside risk or upside benefit sharing. Um, certainly is going to come up in succession planning as well if you're dealing with any family successional planning and the idea is really great to have a senior generation uh, lease land to a separate entity which may be the younger generation or the new acquiring party um, but there could, be a, there could be some wiggle room with how the, the, the rates are negotiated. So when we've done the numbers, I've actually brought one of the sheets here, just to kind of like, you get this idea of like a dollar rental rate on a 240 a pound syrup market, you get to this 12% level. The percentage of the gross value of the product in the marketplace is one way to think about that. And so I'll put, I'll put this on the stack here and it's online, but I did just do some, you know, spend a couple afternoons doing math. Um, doing a percentage of gross revenue chart so you could see well what happens if the market's at 235 a pound and I've got a 75 percent rental rate where's my percentage because we should be prepared for market changes over time and we don't want necessarily people just thinking it should be a dollar because it's always been a dollar maybe it should be a dollar 35 if the market price for maple syrup goes up you know to 260 270 a pound, pound again our folks were it's about 11 pounds per gallon so Mark, is that representing 12% of your syrup check goes to the lease at $1 per tap? Yeah, I gotta, I'm going to pull my, my cue card out here. I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to pass this around. You can take a look at this. You'll see there's a, um, I got a per tap rental rate in each section and then I indicate in the box what the pound price of the maple syrup is and you can sort of see we use some average I actually have different yields here I got, I got a quart a tap 0.35 gallons a tap 0.45 gallons a tap and you can see where the blue column is going to be the percentage of gross revenue. So this 12% from a business standpoint makes sense like if you were yeah, doing a per gallon cost share oh, sure. 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 I'd, I'd, I'd say let's do a cash flow projection on a particular business to figure it out from an advisor perspective, if I saw something that was less than 10% or over 15%, I'd say this needs to be renegotiated. You know, but I think when you get into the nuance of is it viable, now you're kind of back into this world again. You know, you're kind of into this like, am I creating cash or am I investing long term? Because I, you know, yeah. Back to that earlier question about appraised value though or, or real estate, I think the agricultural model we do need to realize generally agriculture historically has been not a very profitable enterprise for a lot of participants. Generally, participants have foregone cash draws for family living to pay debt or to reinvest into real estate. That means people are living on thin cash flows, but they're accruing ownership of property over time. It's like a forced retirement account. <laughs> right? You can have your cash now, or you can have your land ownership later. And, you know, this is sort of the model of agriculture has been cash poor families accruing large amounts of real estate ownership. And I think unfortunately right now, with, you know, with the dairy sector, we see kind of a lot of accrued wealth being kind of cut into by new borrowing again. Um,
but this is a determination, right? If you're going to rent land, you've got to have a profitable business to justify making a payment on something that you have no equity in. You, you've got to create cash at the end of the year. If you're going to own the property, well, you can make some compromises on what you take out now. Theoretically, you're going to take it out later. Uh, okay, so I mentioned some owner-operator relationships. We've got some relation, uh, resources here. We got into this. I just want to take a moment here. Um, bad situations, right? I think we've kind of allude, we started to allude to some issues with leases. So I do want to take like, ask everyone to take like 30 seconds. And this could be a maple experience you've observed. And maybe it's a forestry situation because it, you don't have enough maple stories. But just want you to, everyone to think about one situation where you may want the lease to spell something out or you can imagine needing a lawyer afterwards to sort out a possible dispute. Take a minute, just think of one example. I kind of want to go around, I want to go around the room because everyone thinks a little differently and everyone's observed some different stuff over time. We'll just see how many of these bad situations we can capture. I mean, I got a, a quick one, right? Nope, I not yet. I wait for we, I, right. People, people <laughs> need, need some time, need some time to think. Yeah. Need some thinking, I can smell it. We'll start, we'll start with Chris. We're, just, we're not going to tell stories here because we don't have all day. What's the situation that may require a lawyer to clean up or ideally a lease to sort out previously? Well, it's one of the things I think that got us starting about um, talking about leases, but the guy I sell my sap to built a big, huge sugar house based on a handshake lease to access a whole bunch of maple trees that were nearby, um, the handshake agreement did not pan out in the end. And now he's got a big huge sugar house with no, there's no sap flowing to it. So he buys and transports them exclusively. Um, which is great for me because he wants to buy a lot of sap um, because he's you know, over, over, okay. you know, over production. So no, yeah. not, not formalized tenure or no, access yeah. to the resource. And not deciding to go, I mean, handshake deals are legal, but you gotta enforce them and not deciding to go that way. Okay. Mike, what do you got? Uh, landowner dies three years into a 10-year lease and the lease is not provided for it to be carried through to heirs, successors, assigned agents. Awesome. Let's remember that. Binding on heirs. But, but I just recently I was out with a sugar maker who had a handshake deal with a neighbor. Um, the neighbor uh, changed his mind on what the lease payment was going to be. They have no formal lease. No formal lease and a, a, a suggested price adjustment. <laughs> yeah, all right. How about you? Anyone? Any ideas? Um, issues with BNPs that aren't outweighed on the lease. Who's ah. responsibility? Sounds like compliance. Clients' land was tapped uh, unbeknownst to them by a neighbor <laughs> who had a lease, who guy then died and now the two things just yeah. so, so unbeknownst so so we have some tree poaching going on yeah so like who's responsible for that who's responsible for that one we're dealing with this right now ethan's aware of it a, a right away uh, through property uh and, and differences of opinion on what the right away needs to look like after the access is, is gained so just differences of understanding around yeah. post post conditions so Good. i had a death you know at least like like yeah. yeah. These don't happen all the time, but when they happen, they're like bombs going off, right? Like, it, it, it stops everything. Yeah, I'm thinking like handshake deal that that was great for the older generation. The new generation is just not either aware or not interested in continuing. And then also, uh, yeah, similar to what uh, you said about roads or BNPs, like roads not really being illustrated in the lease at all and what happens when as Fran said you install much too big in October and roads are shit, you know. Like who is supposed to take care of that? What should the roads look yeah, like? Yeah, very common. Especially if the roads haven't been used in four right. years, they're gonna look great. Who's in charge of the the investment improvement compared to who's got what the what the responsibles responsibilities of the operator are. Yeah. yeah, and I just wanna hit that handshake one like that's just a cultural dynamic that it's a cultural dynamic. We trust each other. It's always been done this way. So to present and say, I, I actually need some paperwork here. 
you know, being prepared for that cultural shift between human beings. Some people get it, some people don't want to play ball. Mark, you got a juicy one? Uh, I got a COVID refugee property transfer and there's an existing agreement, handshake deal. Sugar makers left with a landowner who just isn't interested in the full deal. And so they're, they're left with a tubing system that they've invested in, but can't, can't have access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Well, the property change was mine too, but another one to think about is kind of forest management too, or like, are you, these trees are in my way, am I allowed to cut this, or I'm the landowner and this sugar maker came in and cut these trees that I didn't want cut, or the saplings, or damaged a bunch of tree, or good uh, hardware and trees, whatever like that, or yeah. driving up through the equipment to make the roads, but also damaged to not these other like, looking trees, or, or cut out everything that wasn't a maple and I didn't want that. And it seems to me like we've got a few different parties. We've got a landowner. Well, we've got a lawyer that's drafting an agreement. We've got a landowner that does or does not have any idea what's going on in the woods. We've got an operator that has an idea of what they want to do in the woods. And then we've got a forester, possibly, in, there, in that mix as well, right? So The lawyer definitely doesn't know what's going on in the woods either. <laughs> 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 drafted some ridiculous agreement, probably, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say diff like differing expectations about other land stewardship responsibilities. Like mm -hmm. landowner thinks the the lessee is supposed to mark boundaries, manage hunters, do with this stuff like that. Got it. Yeah. A uh, non-resident landowner has a lease with a sugar maker that their father had a handshake deal with and, and she wanted to get it more in writing uh -huh. but it's still not clear uh, the boundaries of where they can and can't tap so the sugar makers eking into an area that she would never thought was going to have more tubing right. more of that ugly tubing all right we're not i think we're going to break for lunch so i will just say that if we do a, i think we'll do a business station in the woods we'll talk a little bit about some of those startup costs let's just see wait Let's just see if we got them all. Or this, this is my guest list. Owner death, successor and assigned section is the lease binding on heirs. That's in, in our template. Lease rate on active, oh, active taps or total property taps available. That, that will come up. What if the producer doesn't want to tap all of them? Problem tenant, and this gets into boundaries, other responsibilities, compliance, termination clauses, right? Having that in there. Prohibited uses. Who's liable? I think someone mentioned BMPs, compliance stuff. Who, who's going to be liable if there's a problem? And you guys were just talking about tubing. This is just a, just a sample, right? There's a, there's a lot that could go wrong. We hope, <laughs> we hope it doesn't. That's why these documents get pretty long, though, because we're trying to, trying to agree to it ahead of time. Because when, right, when this stuff happens, it's not a great time to sit down and talk about how we want to handle it. It's sometimes too late at that point to get, to get together and talk. All right, uh, we're going to stop. I don't think we'll have time for this. We'll, we'll, we'll get back into it, and I can share some of the slides. Um, I think we're going to take lunch, because then we've got an afternoon in the woods. I'll have a business station. We can keep that conversation going.